Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle, and this is my review of the first three episodes of X-Men 97 as I continue to broadcast from the road with the lamps and everything in the room moved around to give me halfway decent lighting. I do what I can. I know it's not optimal, but don't worry. I'll be back in the regular studio soon. The first two episodes are now available on Disney+. Plus. The third episode was sent to critics for review, so I won't discuss that one too in depth, and I won't give away specific spoilers for the first two, but I wanted to talk about this series because it's one of my most anticipated projects of the year. It's a continuation of the popular Fox animated series that ran for five seasons from 1992 to 1997 and for a generation of kids including myself this was our introduction to a world of marvel entertainment that would eventually blossom into the mcu and the original x-men the animated series is one of the best adaptations and portrayals of the x-men period, including a lot of their later live-action counterparts. Many of the original voice cast returned for X-Men 97, including Cal Dodd as Wolverine, Allison Seeley Smith as Storm, Lenore Zan as Rogue, and George Buza as Beast. Many other roles have been recast with actors who evoke the original characters, particularly Ray Chase as Cyclops, who channels the voice work of the late Norm Spencer, who voiced the character in the original show. We've seen so many adaptations, continuations, legacy sequels, all of these different products that are trying desperately to recapture the magic of the original and replicate what made it so special to begin with. And I'm really happy to say that through these first three episodes, X-Men 97 is able to recapture what made the original series so great. The characters feel authentic to the ones that we know. The writing remains both heavy with metaphor and importance, but also funny. And the action has been given a huge upgrade with the advancements in animation over the last nearly 30 years since the show was on the air. This feels like it easily could have been the continuing sixth season of the X-Men show that was on the air back in the 90s, which I'm sure was the intention of the creators behind it. And it also evokes what made the show great, particularly in those first three seasons, and less so in seasons four and five, which were a little more uneven, particularly the fifth season when the animation also was downgraded. In the first two episodes that are live now, we pick up about a year after Professor X's death at the end of the series' original run, with Cyclops now in charge of the team. And one of the things I love about the show is that the characters haven't been given hip upgrades because Cyclops Cyclops, and he was my favorite when I was growing up, but admittedly is as square as he ever was. But that's sort of the enduring lovable thing about this version of Cyclops. And the fact that Wolverine hates having him as the leader of the team perfectly plays into their existing dynamic. What Gyrick did was pretty horrible. But want to know the worst part about the professor being gone? You. I also love that we get a Morph that's fully integrated back into the team, who hasn't lost their prankster ways, and it was nice to see that Morph and Bishop have also now both been added to the main credit sequence. Episode 1 also shows how a series can emulate the animation of an older TV show and yet still take advantage of the advancements in animation technology. The sequence where the X-Men are falling through the sky with Morph helping to rescue the team and Cyclops using his optic blast to cushion his fall wouldn't really have been possible with what you could do when the original show was on the air. And the team fight against the Sentinels also gets a big upgrade. I also loved that storm moment when she uses her lightning to turn the desert sand into glass and then use it against the Sentinels. It's perfectly storm, it doesn't feel out of place, and yet it also feels modern. The show is a throwback, but it's not dated. For example, it's obviously still firmly set in the 90s, right down to the fashions. Hello, Gambit's half shirt. Episode 2, which deals with Magneto taking over the X-Men and his trial in front of the United Nations, felt very much in line with the original series' ongoing story about human persecution of mutants as the Friends of Humanity stormed the UN building during the trial. And yes, an angry mob storming a government-type building during an official proceeding is very reflective of our current history. But that's what X-Men has always done and what it always has been. It's been a reflection of what's going on without bending itself into knots to comment directly on what's been happening. The story of mutants and humans struggling to coexist has been an enduring metaphor for the X-Men over the years, and I was pleased to see that the show didn't try to put a hat on a hat and try to make a direct reference to current politics. The second episode also leaves us with a couple of cliffhangers. First of all, Storm and what her journey is going to be this entire season. And I did not see that twist coming. And then whatever's going to be happening with Jean, which seems to be leading into episode three. I say seems to be, I'm playing it a little coy because I have actually seen episode three, which is going to premiere next week. Don't worry, I'm not going to spoil anything right here. In general terms, I will say that it keeps up the momentum with a few game-changing revelations and one particular sequence that is obviously heavily 
inspired by anime and further pushes the series and its animation envelope. It's a terrific sequence and the episode itself covers a lot of ground. When you look at where you are at the beginning of episode three and where you are at the end of episode three, that's something that the show's always been able to do. You take 30 minutes, you cover so much story ground and you look at it and you say, well, surely that's gonna be rushed if you're just kind of reading a beat by beat breakdown, but it doesn't feel rushed. They're able to do it. And a big reason why is the show always remains focused on the characters. The story flows through the characters and that makes everything feel very natural and very organic because you know who those characters are and you can get work done in one scene that if the characters weren't as well developed, you'd need three or four or five scenes in order to make it work because you have to explain everything. There's a shorthand with these characters because the groundwork has been laid that works with the show. A great example of this is episode two, which devotes screen time to Jean talking to Storm about her guilt and wishing that her baby might be human to avoid persecution as a mutant. You wish him to be born human. I have wondered what it would be like to be human. A lesser show might cut that scene, or maybe never even would have animated it because it doesn't quote unquote advance the action, but it does actually because it advances the characters. And these things are things that you keep in your head that do have repercussions further on down the line. It's something that the show's always been very good at, and I'm glad that they got a team of writers, including a lot of the original talent that returned to work on the show, that understood what it was about the show that made people like it. This is not a cheap knockoff cashing in on nostalgia. There is genuine effort here to make this show as good as we all remember the original one being, and so far, in my opinion, it's succeeding. I will say there is one storyline that's unfolding involving Rogue and Magneto, and I believe it's got some roots in the comics that I, I'm not so sure about. I'm a little iffy about it, but you know what? It's early. We'll see how it unfolds. That's literally, though, the only thing through three episodes that I really had any kind of problem with. Now, normally I stay away from this general topic because I think it's an absolute quagmire, but... I want to address it because it does relate specifically to the X-Men and what the X-Men have always been, which is, as with all things it seems like nowadays, and particularly anything that Disney does, there's a very vocal contingent of people that are blasting this series as being quote-unquote too woke. It's something that you hear all the time. The words basically lost any meaning that it might once have had, and really it's not surprising. It was bound to happen. Setting aside the general cynicism of that, to throw that label, woke, at the X-Men franchise, and X-Men 97 in particular, really just shows how little most of these folks pay attention to the media that they're attaching labels to. I mentioned that the word woke has basically lost all of its meaning because it's been co-opted for so many different things, but to take it back to its origins, roughly, it was originally coined to denote an awareness of societal injustices, and that's something that the X-Men have had dating all the way back to the comics, back to the 1960s. Over the years, the X-Men have served as a metaphor for societal issues like racial prejudice and discrimination, LGBTQ plus persecution. When did you first know you were a... A mutant? Uh, the AIDS crisis and more. It hasn't always been a perfect metaphor, but societal injustice has always been key to the X-Men's impact. To call the X-Men woke is like calling water wet. There's no sinister force that's injecting these messages into the X-Men. Those messages have been there from the very beginning. The only modification I could find that you could call quote unquote current was with the character of Morph, who can change shape and has always been able to change shape into a person of any gender. Morph is now canonically on the show non-binary, but this isn't even specifically referenced on the show at all. The only place that you would know that is if you looked in the end credits and the fact that they use they, them pronouns to refer to Morph. That's it. There's no very special episode, at least not through three episodes, about Morph. It's the same character, the same humor. Everything you love about Morph is there. I'm Jean Grey, humble telepath extraordinaire, and I'm having the most beautiful baby in the world with the most boring man in the world. If that tiny little change is enough to drive you into a mad frenzy about this series and about the X-Men who have always been socially aware, well then maybe the problem isn't with the X-Men, maybe the problem's with you. Not that it matters, the Rage Baiters will soon move on to another topic, having harvested all the clicks and monetization they can get out of X-Men 97, but if you're on the receiving end of these videos, and this, in my opinion, often disingenuous or at the very least exaggerated anger, and it's convincing you in some ways not to watch this show because you feel like 
it's not something that you enjoy. If you were a fan of the original show and you feel like through these videos, this has been co-opted and turned into something else, I would advise you not to take that to heart and give this show a chance, especially if you enjoy the animated series. The original X-Men animated show is very special to me. I was nine years old when it first came out. It really launched me into a big part of my interest in the comics, especially Marvel comics, and is still one of my favorite things to revisit. So it's a pretty high bar to clear. And, you know, it would have been easy for me to come on and just say like, oh, you know, it's fine. It's, it's what it is. But I genuinely do think that this feels like the original show. And when we get to the end of this season so far, I think it's got a good shot of being as good as the original show. If you love the 90s series, I think that X-Men 97 is absolutely in See It Now territory, which is where I'm ranking it. And if you're new to the show, I think that you'll still enjoy it because it does get so much right about the X-Men. Even if you didn't watch the 90s show, they catch you up on what happened and you go into some new adventures. So I really enjoyed this through three episodes. I'll probably come back at the end of this first season and review everything all together. We only got the first three early for review, so I'll be watching week to week with everybody else. What did you think? Did you take a dive into X-Men 97 yet? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for watching me here on the channel. Be sure to stay tuned right here for more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.